review of GoldenEye only covered three out of four Brosnan films, so no great surprise the only female main villain in the Bond series makes the goddess tier. As a bonus, we also get the greatest pre-credit villainess, which almost makes up for the female baddie wilderness that's a Daniel Craig era. Brosnan's films are relatively fun and escapist compared to what followed, but this entry's got a slightly more serious tone. Valentin Zukovsky makes a welcome return as Bond's reluctant ally, and MI6 series regulars are also present. Sadly, this was Desmond Llewellyn's final appearance as Q, but he gets to deliver some of the usual comic antics and gadget testing chaos before his exit. The action sequences are hit and miss, and the main set pieces, attacks by parahawks and sawblade helicopters, a gun battle in a missile silo, and the finale on a doomed submarine, fall flat compared to the spectacular opening. Still, this is a must-watch movie for any Villainess fan, and the twist of having a Bond girl be the main baddie is a refreshing take on the usual formula. There's also a good female in the form of Denise Richards who plays a nuclear physicist called Christmas Jones, an excuse for bad jokes naturally, but this is an entertaining outing nonetheless. The epic opening gambit, the longest in the series before No Time To Die, begins in Bilbao, Spain, with Bond mincing words with a sleazy banker and his henchman. A beautiful woman presents Bond with a cigar, hence the nickname, then it's down to business with 007 demanding answers about a murdered MI6 agent. Things predictably turn nasty and Bond makes short work of the armed thugs. Too bad he forgot about the cigar girl, who bumps off the banker with a throwing knife. Unable to pursue the assassin, Bond makes a dramatic getaway with a suitcase of money after receiving assistance from a mystery sniper. This is all to ensure 007 makes it safely back to London, where he's introduced to Sir Robert King, an oil tycoon who won't be around much longer. That's because the money's laced with explosives, and King's lapel pin is a proximity trigger. With MI6 under attack, it's time for a familiar foe to return. It turns out the action in Spain was itself a teaser, because the big chase is along the River Thames, with Bond in a gadget-equipped boat pursuing the cigar girl past several famous landmarks, from the houses of Parliament to the Millennium Dome. The assassin proves elusive, a skill with piloting a boat as she is at murder. More than once she evades Bond by making sudden turns or cutting under a descending bridge. That's a cue for Bond to submerge the boat to bypass the obstacle and straighten his tie. When evasive tactics don't work, the cigar girl goes on the offensive. <laughs> Villainess wrecks another boat and cuts 007 off, or so she thinks. Like all vehicle chases in Bond films, the hero finds a detour, which involves a land ride through a street market, narrow alley with police cars on his tail, and through a restaurant back to the Thames. Bond launches torpedoes at the assassin, but she makes her own dramatic escape like any good pre-credit villain. The final confrontation has the cigar girl hijack a hot air balloon and Bond leap onto the mooring rope. Just tell me who's behind this, who you're working for. Don't do it! Don't blow us up! I can protect you. Do you understand? I can protect you! Not from him! The Cigar Girl and Sequence will be good enough for a lower tier ranking all by herself, but here she's just one of many reasons to love this movie. The sole honourable mention for this review goes to a mostly silent sexy henchwoman who looks the part but doesn't do much, which unfortunately sums up the lack of female villains in the Daniel Craig era. 
The second Martin Campbell directed reboot is essentially an origin story with a black and white prologue and a reckless 007 before he became the Swave secret agent we know. Despite a back to basics approach, there are action scenes aplenty, notably a free run chase sequence and a race to stop a bomb attack at Miami airport. The plot centres around Le Chief, a banker funding terrorists who bomb must be in a high stakes poker game at the title Casino Royale. Judy Dench is still M, but there is no money penny or Q yet, so Bond has to rely on actual spy work and resilience to complete his mission. The main female character is Vespa Lind, a treasury agent who gets the usual pun introduction but becomes a genuine love interest. Eva Green is a standout performance in the franchise, and there's real chemistry between her and Craig's 007. Bond always has a weakness for women, so has no idea Vespa is working with the shadowy organisation behind Le Chief. It's eventually revealed her boyfriend was kidnapped to coerce her help, so Vesper is a tragic character and not a true villainess. And a death in the Venice finale is the most downbeat outcome since Honor Majesty's Secret Service. As for Valenka, she gets a sexy introduction and seems to always be present for Lachie's business dealings. Despite being attacked by a machete-wielding thug halfway through, she remains loyal to the main villain and doesn't seem too bothered by violence when she's not the target. The beautiful henchwoman's best moment is poisoning Bond's drink at Casino Royale, but she simply vanishes near the end. A scream implies Valenka is killed when Le Chief's employers decide he's no longer a value. Best get used to disappointments with this Bond, it only gets worse from here. What little story exists in this week outing is difficult to follow and the jump cut action sequences are more likely to induce headaches than actually thrill. Add unnecessary arty title cards whenever events shift to a new location, poor direction for exposition scenes and possibly the weakest henchman in the entire series and the end result is fairly dire. A woman named Strawberry Fields, yes really, gets caught with denial for a death scene homage to the superior Goldfinger, which sums up the lack of imagination on offer. Olga Kurilenko portrays Camille, a former Bolivian Secret Service agent who assists Bond in his mission. She handles herself well in the action scenes, parachute escape from a crashing plane being the highlight, but her own vendetta is even less interesting than Bond's quest to avenge Vespa. The final action sequence in a desert hotel is as messy as what came before, and the only plus point here is brevity. Clocking at 106 minutes, this is the shortest Bond movie to date. Craig's third movie breaks with tradition completely by not giving us a true Bond girl. Judy Dench plays M for the final time, receiving a more prominent role in the story and a great send-off. Naomi Harris is an MI6 operative who does more harm than good at times. More importantly, her name is Eve Moneypenny, an entirely different origin from the usual secretary. Q also makes a comeback in the form of a much younger boffin, though gadgets are limited to a palm reader gun and radio. The closest fit to the traditional Bond girl role is Severine, a former sex slave now a trophy and accomplice of the main villain Silver. He's a former agent out to get revenge on him, leading to a story set mainly in the UK. Severine looks beautiful in the more exotic locations of Shanghai and Macau, and like all ill-fated women in 007 movies, gets to romance Bond before the villain disposes for her in theatrical fashion to show how evil he is. Skyfall is regarded as one of the better Bond movies, perhaps because it doesn't follow the established formula, the terror attacks on the London Underground and parliamentary hearing are well staged, leading to a MacGyver style final confrontation in Scotland with Bond dusting off a familiar Aston Martin, however female antagonists are once again notably absent. The return of Ernst Stavro Blofeld and his title evil organisation promised much, but ultimately delivered little. Mexico City during the Day of the Dead celebrations is a spectacular backdrop for an action-packed pre-title sequence, but unfortunately that's the sole highlight. The film somehow manages to make a shadowy spectre conference, a car chase through the streets of Rome, and a fight with a tough henchman all seem boring. No female villains, is that really a surprise for this Bond? But even the leading lady Madeleine Swan doesn't have any real chemistry with 007. She gets a mysterious backstory but no character development of note until the next movie six years later. Monica Bellucci appears briefly as a suicidal widow of a Spectre agent Bond killed in a teaser. He saves the woman's life and seduces her for information, which leads to possibly the most uncomfortable fling in the entire series. Add an unnecessary twist about Bond's guardian being Blofeld's father, revealed in a painfully long exposition scene, a dull plot about controlling intelligence, and a flat finale in the ruins of MI6 with the old hostage girlfriend ploy, and there's very little to get excited about. Need a cure for insomnia, Spectre might be the solution. 
Finally, the producers seem to remember what the series is supposed to be about, thrilling action and sensational women, and despite a family subplot and weak villain scheme bogging down the final act, it's a fitting send-off for Craig's gritty 007. In this one, nobody is safe. Major characters, including CIA ally Felix Leiter and Nemesis Blofeld, are killed off, foreshadowing the finale when Bond himself dies in a missile strike. Yes, the rule book has well and truly been torn up. The longest pre credit sequence to date begins with a flashback to Madeline as a child before we shift to the present and Spectre agents come after Bond and the adult Madeline in Italy. A dejected Bond retires from MI6 and an agent named Nomi becomes the replacement 007. On a rogue CIA mission to recover a traitor scientist, Bond receives assistance from Paloma, a rookie operative surprisingly proficient with firearms and unarmed combat. The best action woman in Kray's tenure disappointingly only appears for 10 minutes, but Paloma herself certainly isn't a disappointment. Nomi gets some badass moments too, but always ends up overshadowed by Bond. Madeline also gets to shoot some bad guys during a chase in Norway, though the story is really about saving her and Bond's child Matilde. Safin is a decent enough foe, but is defeated too easily, though he does infect the hero with nanobots, which leads to the ultimate sacrifice. Three major female characters, and once again, no villainess. Let's hope the next Bond actor actually gets to face some bad girls. Straight after the title song, Electra makes her first appearance at her father's funeral. The first half of the movie sets her up as a traditional Bond girl who the hero must protect, with the main villain implied to be Renard, an anarchist who previously kidnapped Electra and now appears to be tagging her again. King's daughter is now running his former oil company and in charge of pipeline construction in Azerbaijan. Not the safest part of the world to work in, and after Electra and Bond are attacked by Parahawks while skiing in the local mountains, using a safety coat gadget to shield the girl from an avalanche brings the two of them very close together. Surprisingly, Bond doesn't immediately make love to Electra, instead showing genuine concern for her safety when he's invited to a luxury Baku residence. Don't go. Stay with me. Please. I can't do that. I thought it was your job to protect me. <laughs> Be safe here. I don't want to be safe. I'll be back soon. And who's afraid now, Mr. Bond? There are plenty of dodgy looking males around, including a tough henchman and the head of security, so no shortage of suspects who could be working with Renard. As a villain predating the more serious Craig era films, Renard comes with a gimmick, in this case a bullet lodged in his brain which eliminates any sense of pain. Determined to identify his parahawk attackers, Bond visits Valentine at a local Russian mob casino where everybody in the room, from the high rollers to the attractive female employees, are armed. Bond is worried about Electra, but she doesn't seem to share his concern. One card, Hydro. A million dollars. Wait. Bury the top three cards. You're determined to protect me, aren't you? Perhaps from yourself. You don't have to do this. There's no point in living if you can't feel alive. of hearts. It appears that you have been beaten by the ace of clubs. No hard feelings, my dear. Come again soon. Shall we? Electra. This is a game I can't afford to play. I know. 
The first signs this woman might not be as innocent as she appears, but Bond doesn't waste any time bedding her. Bond's investigation leads him to the pipeline construction site where his treacherous head of security learns the British spy has a license to kill. After a long plane trip, Bond discovers a plot to steal a nuclear bomb from a missile silo. This is where we first introduce to Christmas Jones who goes from being a suspicious scientist to an unlikely ally once Renard and his henchmen start shooting. Christmas is the reliable non-screaming Bond girl type who is quite happy to help despite bullets and explosions not being the usual day at the office. Despite Bond's best efforts, Renard escapes with a bomb and it soon revealed the villain's plans to detonate a nuclear device in the lecturer's pipeline. Now there's a second woman involved, it's inevitable, at least in this era, one of them will turn out to be bad. When Bond and Christmas ride a vehicle through the pipe and discover only half the plutonium core is in the bomb, 007 makes a calculated choice to let the device explode. I'm so sorry. But I have a gift for you. Something that belonged to my father. He would have wanted you to have it. Perhaps this isn't the time. Please. He often spoke of how compassionately you advised him on the best course of action during my kidnapping. It's very valuable, you know. I just couldn't let it explode with the rest of him. I was very upset when the money didn't kill both of you. I didn't think I'd get another chance. Then you dropped the answer right in my lap. Bond. And as you say, he's the best you have. Or should I say, had. <laughs> Take her to the helicopter. Yes, we finally do have a female main villain in this long running series. Now we know who's responsible for King's murder, it's time to reveal Electra's endgame by questioning Valentine again, this time at a caviar factory in the Caspian Sea. Von learns the villainess and her henchman Renard have acquired a nuclear submarine and the plan is to create a meltdown to destroy Istanbul and contaminate the surrounding sea. With so much wealth and power at stake, no wonder Electra has a hold over Renard. The two have a somewhat sinister sex scene where Electra runs ice over her body and clearly enjoys inflicting psychological torture on her accomplice. Meanwhile, M's locked in a cell in Maiden's Tower, but still manages to broadcast a signal to the good guys using a missile locator card. After an amusing scene where Bond and Christmas interrogate Valentine as he's drowning in caviar, the treacherous gold tooth henchman sells them out to Electra. Time for physical torture now, so the villainess uses an antique chair and neck restraint. Just perfect for strangling a man while Electra gives the villainous motive ramp we've come to expect. So, you killed your father. He killed me. He killed me the day he refused to pay my ransom. And that was this all about the oil? It is my oil. Ooh. Mine. And my family's. It runs in my veins, thicker than blood. I'm going to redraw the map. And when I'm through, the whole world will know my name, my grandfather's name, the glory of my people. No one will believe this meltdown was an accident. Ha! They will believe. They will all believe. You understand? Nobody can resist me. The sadistic Electra even takes the opportunity to rape Bond while he's at a mercy and is enjoying a moment of triumph until Valentine crashes the party. If Bond was expecting his old nemesis to come to the rescue, he shouldn't have been so optimistic. I'm looking for a submarine. It's big and black and the driver is a very good friend of mine. Bring it to me. What a shame. He's just gone.
Sukovsky really hated you. Still, that's enough for the hero to escape and chase Elektra up Maiden's Tower. Disappointingly, she's not the last villain standing as there's a lengthy sequence after this where Bond must stop Renard melting down the submarine reactor and then it's the usual scenario of rescuing the Bond girl who actually does prove useful again and an old style ending with a bad joke and then surprised by a top agent's womanising. Before the somewhat anticlimactic finale, Bond must deal with Electra. Call him off. I won't ask again. Call him off. Call him off! A nod. You wouldn't kill me. You'd miss me. Yes. Die, Bond! <laughs>